As a parent, what would you do if your worst nightmare came true? You found out your son is being sexually touched, and then shortly thereafter he's abducted, especially by someone that knows him well. This is what I've been through over the last nine months. Here's how it all began. On February 4th, 2013, my six-year-old son came home from school. He had just had a lecture. It was his first one at school in regards to, you know, kids in trouble and inappropriate touching and kids that need help. So he comes home and he tells me, Dad, I think I need help. My older brother has been touching me. And he describes an event at Christmas when he was at his biological father's house. And he got woke one night to his older brother, who was then 13, in his bed. And he was fighting to keep his underwear. And it went from there. So for the next two days... I attempt to get a hold of my other half, who was uh, at a wedding in the U.S. And she doesn't respond. She's not answering. I don't hear anything. February 4th was a Monday, and I'll never forget it. Thursday morning, I go to the school. Um, Connor's principal is a child psychologist, and she knows him very well. For the year and a half that he was in the school... He was an extraordinarily exceptional student. He was even a spokesperson for the school. He was in a bilingual program, and he, about five months into the program while in kindergarten, six months into the program, had already started giving speeches to new families considering, you know, coming to the school. He was fluently switching between both languages and welcoming new parents and new families to the school. So the principal knew him very well. He always did. Connor looked forward to seeing her every day and always asked if she could go. To, he could go to her office and say hi and spend a few minutes with her. So she knew him really well. I sat down with her and I asked for help and I explained what had happened. And um, I gave her a little more details. The older brother has been acting out for about two to three years and he himself has been showing many signs that he's being sexually molested and has been for a long time. He, however, lives with a biological father, so there's very little that uh, uh, we could do. I was always talking to my partner in regards to it, but she just refused to you know, get him any help. She wouldn't do anything. And she had stated a couple of times that uh, if I attempted to do anything to get him help, that um, she would take Connor and run. So I had to take that threat personally. Or, 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 you know, seriously. So anyways, I, I spend the morning at the school with the principal, and she very quickly arranges a meeting with Child Protective Services and gets me the help that I need. They give me a, a very solid, you know, plan of action to put into place and to move forward. So Friday morning, the uh, biological mother, my partner, gives me a call and actually finally gets a hold of me and you know, asks about whether Connor is going to his biological father's that weekend or not. And I tell her, you know, I, I this is what's happened and I can't let him go. And, you know, I've got the support of Child Protective Services. That's This is what they feel is best. So you would think as a mother, the first thing you would do is protect your child and find out, you know, what has happened, what really happened, what went on, and so on and so forth. But no, within an hour... She arranges the abduction of him. She arranges someone to come to the house, the biological father to come to the house, and without any warning, simply take him. Uh, A parental kidnapping is the only way to explain it. Um, The biological father has had no rights to the son. He signed them all over when the child was 11 months old. It was kind of funny. When I first met Connor, he was 11 months old. And um, um, the biological mother moved in with me, and she had two kids with the biological father. One was then, you know, Connor was 11 months, and the older one was about seven years. And uh, the biological father made a pretty clear statement as to what he felt towards the kids. 
he signed um, paperwork sharing all guardianship and custody of the older boy. But he turned over absolutely all rights to the younger boy. He wanted nothing to do with them. Except being able to come and, you know, visit him every couple of weekends and nothing more than that. And he never proceeded to do anything more than that. He would never offer any child support. He's never made a decision in the child's life. He's never been involved in the child's life. He's been what some refer to as a, you know, a Disney parent where he, he takes some 10, 12 weekends out of a year and that's about it. Does nothing else. Anyways, so she arranges him to come and pick him up and just take him. Within a couple of hours, Connor is then placed in the very bedroom with the older brother with whom he is begging for help and protection from. And you know what? It only goes on from there. The physical violence between the older brother and Connor had been escalating for a long time. Um, the older brother has always, for, the, for like two or three years, been inappropriately grabbing him and touching him. And um, You know, there was an event within a week of Connor living there where the older brother told Connor in the backyard to stand still and he went to the other side of the yard he got a bat and he started picking up acorns and he started batting them at Connor and he told him if you stay still I won't hit you you know it's just like a knife thrower if you stay there you won't get hit and of course what happens you know as any parent knows Connor gets hit and not only does he get hit he gets an acorn batted right in the eye so he's standing there this little six-year-old with an acorn just come out of his eye and he's screaming and, and wailing and crying and do you think a parent came to his rescue? No, because nobody heard him, because nobody was around. This is the type of parent the biological father is. He's not there, he doesn't participate, and he doesn't supervise. So, of course, the older brother has to leave Connor in the backyard, or chooses to leave Connor in the backyard, all by himself, screaming and crying, while he goes into the house and tries to find a parent to come out. Now you tell me, is this how you parent? Is, is this how you look after or protect your kids? Where you take your son who says, Mom, I need help. Someone's hurting me. And then put him in the very bedroom with the boy. You know, I two days later in conversations, the biological father actually admitted to me that he himself had been touching Connor. So now not only is the older brother touching him, but the biological father is as well. I, I don't even know where to go with this and what to do. You're, the, the courts have been all but useless because, of course, the uh, biological mother has, or, you know, my partner, um, has backed the biological fa father's story. The two of them have created quite a tangled web of lies. And uh, they managed to find a very, very crooked lawyer who has no problem standing up in court lying through his teeth and making things up. As a matter of fact, in one court session, I had to submit a 131-page affidavit which cross-referenced three different sets of transcripts and demonstrated, I believe, close to somewhere in the number of 40 lies that the lawyer himself had stated in open court in a period of three sessions. And, and it was, yeah, it was a period of three sessions. It was basically one session contradicting the other two. There was an astronomical amount of lies. He has absolutely no problem just sitting there making things up and telling lies. I have since, to uh, strengthen my position, voluntarily submitted to three separate polygraph tests where I hired a company and gave them a whack of questions and voluntarily polygraphed on all of the tough issues in this case so that I could submit it to the courts and demonstrate it. Who's really telling the truth and who's really lying? But you know what? At the end of the day, the courts aren't working because they're not listening. There's one lawyer that's involved and he has no trouble whatsoever lying through his teeth. And being an officer of the court, the court believes him. Can't seem to condone that a, that a lawyer might lie, even though you submit transcript evidence showing them black and white that the lawyer has lied through his teeth. So anyways, I've got complaints with the Law Society. I've got complaints with the Canadian Judicial Society. There's lots of complaints going on, but at the end of the day, I'm now in the process of having to file and maintain five separate appeals with the Alberta Court of Appeals, five of them, to save Connor. 
to get him from being hurt, to get people to stop touching him, and to get him back where he belongs. He was in a bilingual school studying two languages, and he was top of his class. He was an incredible student. He always did everything that was asked of him. On top of that, he had extracurricular activities. He had swimming, he had kung fu, he had art, he had uh, guitar lessons, he had done gymnastics, he even did a, a, a year of, of dance. He just wanted to try it. So he's a very active, active boy. And the bilingual program, like many of these, have a parents' association. And Connor, even in kindergarten and grade one, knew he wanted to volunteer and help out the parents' organization. And he did at several points in time, where he would give up his time to go help out others, because that's the boy that he is. Well, after he was abducted and taken to where he was taken, they waited a week before they enrolled him in school again, kept him out of school for an entire week. In the year and a half that he had been in school, he'd never missed a day, not a minute of school, never. They keep him out of school for a week. They put him in an all-English program, of which um, the teacher um, blatantly, incompetently dis um, evaluates him. Her evaluation was so pathetic. I don't know how she's even a teacher. Um, she had evaluated him as never being taught English, yet he's in a bilingual program. She evaluated him as not knowing what a space was. Well, you know, you can't print without spaces, and part of the bilingual language involved spaces, and he was fluent in writing in the second language, as you would be between kindergarten and, and grade one. So, he most certainly knew what a space was. She basically did a pathetic one or two hour assessment and uh, he challenged her and she didn't challenge him back. My son is an extraordinarily bright boy. When he's asked to do something by new people, he'll, he has no problem with challenging you. He'll uh, you know, do something in a certain fashion and see if you'll call him on it. See if you'll actually say you can't possibly have meant to do that or challenge him. And if you don't challenge him, you know what? He'll keep right on going back challenging you. And that's what he did to her. Made her look like an idiot. Little six-year-old boy made a grade one English teacher look like an idiot. Yes, he was never taught English. And yes, he didn't know what a space was. Yet he was top of his class in the previous school. In two languages. He now has become a solid C student. Lucky to see a B or anything along those lines. Because, of course, he gets no help where he is. And that doesn't surprise me. The older brother has um, become a drastic underachiever. When he went to junior high, his grades started to plummet. And um, he, he almost failed the grade last year. He was one or two tests away from not passing. And this is what's now happening to the younger one. It uh, has become more than evident what they did was they sacrificed the six-year-old boy to keep the 13-year-old out of jail for molesting him or to keep him from talking to the police. I mean, they don't put a 13-year-old boy in jail, but he would have trouble with the police. So they have sacrificed the 6-year-old, his life, his future, put him into a substandard education, have him in the same bedroom and under the same unsupervised association with the very boy who he was begging for help from. And you know what? I need your help. Legal fees have getting, gotten astronomical, and I really need help in, in solidifying a better lawyer who's more appropriate for the Court of Appeals. And any legal advice or legal research or any, any directions I could be pointed in, I need your help. Connor needs your help. No six-year-old boy should go through life getting molested by his older brother or even by his biological father. I, yeah, I don't even know what to say. How do you, how does it get any worse than being touched by not one family member but two family members, and then having your biological mother just turn you over to them and refuse to help you, have your cries go on deaf ears, and and nobody listens to you and nobody helps you. They just keep letting all the assaults, both physical and sexual, continue. You know, as I was uh, 
gathering letters of reference for Connor for court. I found three other adults that Connor had asked for help from. He had went to his English teacher and described how his older brother had, had, had attacked him on many occasions and they fought a lot and how his older brother would hurt him and how he hated going to that house for what he was put through. He had said the same thing to a, uh, a, a friend of the family. He played with a couple of kids from school and uh, their mother happens to run a day home. She's a child development supervisor and he had told her too in passing that you know, he he was happy for his friends because they had an older brother that they could play with and, you know, he could have a good time with, that his older brother would always hurt him and that he didn't like visiting him. But he really liked, you know, his friend's older brother because he was a really nice boy. And, of course, he asked for help from his kung fu teacher in how to protect himself when his older brother was going to hit him or hurt him. So I need your help. I need to save my son. I need to get him out of there. And I need a, a more aggressive, stronger lawyer to help with the Court of Appeals. And for that, I need a larger budget. And I really, really need some help in any way, shape, or form. You can read more about it. I've uh, shared a lot of information about the Connor and what's going on and different fam various family members. And I'm going to share more as time goes on on a website that I put up. The website is uh, http colon slash slash help save dot my son connor dot com and connor is spelt with an e there's no www at the beginning it's just help save dot my son connor dot com again connor is spelt with an e i'm going to put the website address in the description of this video below so please, I beg of everybody, any help you can give me to save Connor. No six-year-old should be touched by two family members. No six-year-old should lose his future and go from a top student to being a mediocre, run-of-the-mill student. No one should have to suffer a second-rate education, all because they asked for help for being touched from family members. Please, I beg of you, help me save my son. God bless you.